Okay, please bear with me. This is my first attempt at a video review, so um, there's bound to be some glitches. But here's how the Owen came packaged, basically. It's double boxed, although it's not really a hefty two boxes. <clears throat> but adequate, I think. Outer box, inner box. Cute little box for display, although it's kind of funny. It's, it's a kind of... Um, box that was developed for any of the scopes. So it says bandwidth 60 megahertz to 300 megahertz. So if you saw this sitting on a shelf in a shop, you might think, wow, it goes to 300 megahertz. Instead of the fact that they're talking about the entire line. So inside the box, that's what it looks like. Well, fairly protected. I've got the standard USB power cord and the scope. Booklet. I already took the probes out. They were in here along with the disc and the manual, an actual printed manual. Although <laughs> the manual again looks like something we all were cranking out on our laser printers 15 years ago. But anyway, there is an actual printed manual. Scope itself. There we go. Now the scope did come with a piece of plastic on here, which I peeled off. Um, so there was a protect, protection on the display. Uh, it also came with these little BNC covers, um, which I popped off the two channel inputs, but I've left on the external trigger. So here are the probes that came with the uh, Owen scope. As I mentioned in my post on uh, EEV blog, um, I'm going to be comparing this to the Rigel, um, <coughs> or is it Rigel? I have no idea. DS um, 1052E because well, for two reasons. That's the only other DSO I've ever owned, and I just had one for a month, testing it out and uh, returned it to go for this. It's not completely fair since this costs about 18% more than the Rigol, but um, since it's the only thing I can compare it against, that's what I'm doing. Uh, I don't have the Rigol anymore, so I can't compare it directly, but um, right off the bat, these probes feel much nicer than the Rigol ones. Um, uh, they feel heftier. Um, the compensation adjustment is here as opposed to, I believe on the Reichel it was on the handle. Um, instead it's on the actual jack itself. And um, uh, the main thing I guess is, one thing that was driving me crazy with the Reichel was that the little 10 times, one time switch was really easy to throw. And I was constantly um, knocking it to the wrong setting and not realizing it later till I was measuring. And this one is very solid, has a, ver a nice click and uh, it won't be easy to do that with. Um, the wire feels heftier. Um, they just feel better and more solid in pretty much every respect. <clears throat> I mean, the, the various attachments you get are the same, of course. And um, these are rated for 100 megahertz as opposed to the Rigels, which I believe are 60. So basically, I wanted to look at the build quality of this uh, in this section of the review. Um, I actually was surprised. It's a bit better than I was expecting after things I'd read about the Owen's other products online. The layout is more or less standard in a lot of other DSOs. Um, I am a big fan of the separate vertical controls for the two channels as opposed to the Rigel that had just one set of vertical controls and you had to constantly swap to get on the right channel and you often forgot and were, you tended to move the wrong channel. Um, I'm not a big fan of having the trigger menu button here and the knob here as opposed to the other way around to keep them in line, but I suppose some companies do that to, to keep it separate from the horizontal and vertical position controls for the channels. Other than that, the, the, the layout is rather standard, although this has basically two rows of menu keys, which we'll get into more when we um, start looking at the firmware. Um, this is real handy for some things and a pain in the ass for the others, but again, I'll get into the strengths and the weaknesses of that later. Um, as noted before in, in, in another online review, there seems to be a little IR LED here as if they're thinking about the possibility of making remote controllers for these devices. I'm not quite sure how they'd be used, but anyway, that's sitting there. Um, other than that, the front is you know, rather unremarkable, except for the fact of that giant 8-inch display, um, which, by the way, does have anti-glare coating on it, which is great. I mean, the display in general is very beautiful, um, both off and on. 
Um, now going around the side, let's look at the various <coughs> connectors and whatnot. Um, here you see this empty LAN port for the LAN, which Owen was advertising, advertising online, is coming with these models, but they haven't managed to implement it yet, so it's not here. Um, this is labeled as COM slash monitor, but it looks like a standard SVGA or VGA, you know, connector to me, so I'm not sure how you get RS-232 signals out on it. I haven't seen any data that would explain that yet, or if that's possible. Um, we'll get into the VGA output later when we start looking at the firmware again. It has the, um, you know, typical host and uh, device USB connectors here. Um, the other side has the AC power in. It has a little fuse holder can pop out and it has the master power switch. There's another power switch on top. The reason I guess they've divided it is um, if you have the battery installed, you can have it turned down and charging the battery but keep the display and the rest of the unit turned off. But the battery compartment is here. I have not bought the optional battery yet. Um, although that is a great feature to have and it's one of the reasons I was interested in this. One obvious design flaw here is that um, the ba this thing weighs, I mean, it has, a, it has a very good heft to it for the size. It feels good, a good weight for its size. Um, it's heavy enough to not float around too much, um, but, but not too light that it feels somehow cheaply made. Um, but adding the battery, obviously, is going to add weight to it. So clearly, if you do have a battery, sometimes you want to use it and sometimes you don't. If you're going to an on-site job where there's plenty of, you know, AC available and you don't have to worry about the battery, you might want to leave it out just to leave out the weight of carrying it. But they've, the battery compartment itself is um, attached with very long screws. So here's the battery compartment with the screws loosened um, and the block being taken out. This obviously is just a kind of insert when there's no battery there. Battery does not go inside it. Um, I'm not sure. I I, since I don't have a battery, I assume it attaches the same way with two screws that go in these holes. Um, personally, just in terms of speed and, you know, swapping to battery usage and not, I probably would have preferred some kind of clip there um, as opposed to screws. Um, but perhaps for over time, the screws are, you know, more reliable. So the back has only the pass-fail trigger output and a ground lug here. I'm not a big fan of the connectors on the sides of devices as opposed to the back. Um, I guess I understand from a design point of view the reason Owen did it was because obviously um, the main PCB in this is mounted um, parallel to the front panel as opposed to perpendicular. So I suppose that's the reasoning. Um, I'm not a huge fan like I said but Maybe it's a small price to pay for the, the thin size, I'm not sure. Again, it feels quite solidly made. It, it feels there's no flex in the unit at all. Um, feels well, well built for the most part. It does, by the way, have a fan inside. Um, probably a lot of people were wondering about that. Uh, the fan is very quiet, um, as it should be. The Rigel had a horrible fan, and that, that alone was one reason I was constantly thinking about getting rid of it. It really was, I've got three computers running here, and that Rigel fan was louder than all three combined. I'm not sure if that comes through at all. It's, it is really whisper quiet. You, you don't know there's a fan there unless you put your ear right up to the thing or feel a small amount of air moving out of it. We can look better at the knobs because I wanted to go over these a little bit. Um, generally speaking, they feel reasonably okay. Um, the smaller turn knobs here feel a little bit iffy. Um, I, and I've noticed when, when I've been using this for the last few days now, that um, I sometimes hear a little noise as if these things are already starting to, you know, run into ever so slight problems. So I'm, I'm not sure about those. Um, what's interesting, one thing that's interesting is that all of the knobs on here are clearly knobs that have switches installed. 
although they're only using the, the, the switches on those five knobs and not the larger ones, which is a shame because they don't have the coarse and fine control for vertical and horizontal position as, as Rigol does. Um, and that I, I kind of miss already. Uh, there's just a coarse control and nothing else. Um, these knobs, the, the menu select knobs, are, sorry, buttons I should say, um, you know, you can tell from the, from the sound of them, I mean, there are these little membrane, cheapo membrane switches that anyone who's you know made any PCBs is, you know, are are well aware of. Uh, generally, it's okay, but you'll notice, first of all, these are all mounted on a separate PCB, which is is slightly floating there. So if I, I hope that camera picks that up, if I wobble this a little bit, you see them all wobbling. So that's 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 a little kind of shoddy looking, but. You know, more so than that, they've got it mounted so close to the display in such a way that when you're clicking them sometimes, you're causing a little bit of a disruption to the LCD display. Let's see if we get that. You see that? Some kind of close mounting right there at the edge is causing disruption, which I don't think is, should really happen. Again, clicking there, I'm getting a little bit of wobble in the display there. Um, the other thing, uh, hang on, this, this obviously has the feet which tilt the display. The other thing, because some of the knobs and, and, and buttons are so, so, so stiff, um, on a slightly slippery desktop like this, um, pushing them, these are not a problem because of the angle they're mounted at and they're near the bottom where the rubber feet are. But for example, these, I can't click them without shoving the display around. Same with the push knobs on here. So you have to come in with a hand behind to, to switch these. That's not a big deal, but you know, still, um, they're maybe a little stiffer than they ought to be for perfect usability.